We've got one good question here because this was something that I was thinking about when we were talking about risk factors and, and we didn't touch on it. Uh, what about alcohol consumption? We know that there seems to be a connection with breast cancer. What about in colorectal cancer? There's not a lot of compelling data that alcohol is a major issue in colorectal cancer. Mm -hmm. And we certainly don't see any evidence that moderate use of alcohol <laughs> is a problem. There's a, a thousand good reasons not to abuse alcohol. Um, and uh, I think colon cancer is going to be very far down on that list. Fair enough. We talked about, Dr. Guillaume, you mentioned that, and, uh, that we're kind of stuck with the prep right now. Is there a reason that there isn't a, a more palatable or a slightly easier prep? Uh, are we really stuck with it, or is there something that might come down the, down the road that will make the prep a little easier on us? I'm optimistic there will be something that will come down the road, but I know from having worked with these prep um, companies for several years, I think we've gone, we've reduced the volume. And for those of you who may have had colonoscopy years ago, this was referred to as go lightly, which I thought was an interesting term for something that was going to be five <laughs> yeah. liters. And it was not going to go lightly on you at all, but rather quite explosive if you, you didn't have the right so, results. So like I Madison think Madison Avenue got a hold of that one. Right, exactly. <laughs> It's a smaller product. Uh, I think there have been some difficulties with some products that you might have been aware of, and we've, we've uh, avoided these products that have caused uh, significant side effects and, uh, and complications. There was a pill for a while that, that was approved for the PrEP, but it seems that most uh, GI uh, folks have kind of moved away from that. It was uncomfortable because a lot of pills the patients had to take it didn't result in, a qual in the similar quality of, of the cleansing. And I think that... Uh, so my answer is yes, I'm optimistic something will come about. Um, I think that um, one pearl that I would say to, as I have prepared for my colonoscopy, as Lenny has as well, I can tell you, and I do them, so I know that a, a suggestion I strongly make to friends and patients is that to drink lots of fluids, this, regardless of what preparation you may have been ordered to take, I would suggest that you add lots of extra clear fluids alongside of that prepare with something warm because I think it's the, the, the hypothermia that you get from not eating is which is most, most bothersome for me. Mm. But if I'm having lots of warm teas and chicken broth and things of that sort, it's not that bad. It's palatable. And it's a lot of volume will translate into an optimal prep. Dr. Goodman, do polyps always become tumors? Or is it just that we can't tell the difference? Mm -hmm. No, I mean, we know that it's certainly the, a precursor lesion, but not all polyps are going to become um, tumors. And because of that, you know, there's a, a sort of well-established pathway of an adenoma to a carcinoma and certainly um, mutations that go along, but we can't actually say that this one is absolutely going to become a, mm. a tumor or not. And there are certain types of um, adenomas that are higher risk, and I probably would defer to Dr. Guillaume to talk more in detail about that, but I think in general it's because we don't know which one is going to become a tumor. Um, adenoma and polyp are kind of synonymous? Yes, okay. and um, there are certain subtypes of adenomas, but it's, uh, it is because of that fact that there's a, a risk of, a, of uh, progression to cancer, but it's a certain percentage. We just don't know which one is going to become a, a, a cancer, and so it makes sense that you remove it, and it's not worth leaving it in sure. for the pro sure. possibility of cancer. I would turn that around a little bit. Not all polyps become tumors but virtually all tumors come from polyps. Mm -hmm. So if we take out all polyps, we prevent virtually all tumors. How about, this is an interesting question because it's sort of a hot topic these days in terms of cancer prevention, vitamin D. Good, bad? Now we've, we've read that we're, uh, here in the Northern Hemisphere, and particularly when the sun goes down at 4.30 in the afternoon, we're kind of all somewhat vitamin D deficient, especially during the winter, because we're not getting enough sunlight. So, and when we do get sunlight, even during the summer, we're slathering ourselves in sunscreen, a good thing, by the way. Um, so we're kind of vitamin D deficient in the, in the Northern Hemisphere. Now we're hearing a lot that this really may be a, a good cancer preventative. What do you guys right. think? So the data are that a substantial portion of the population is vitamin D deficient. Now, remember that the normal levels of vitamin D were established in the 1950s when the vitamins were basically beginning to be understood simply by taking a large population of people, measuring their vitamin D level, and defining a mean and a standard deviation around that mean and calling it normal. Um, we spent it, a lot more time outdoors then. Exactly, and we, 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 we spent more time outdoors. We were less concerned uh, with sunscreen because we didn't know to be. Mm -hmm. Um, and as a result, now normal vitamin D levels may be lower. So to what degree we are all vitamin D deficient and what degree we need to reset our thermostat for what's normal, I don't know. 
That having been said, there are data that there is a high degree of vitamin D deficiency, if you will, in the population. There's a high degree of vitamin D deficiency in colorectal cancer patients. Whether repletion of that vitamin D will lead to a prevention of the cancer is a reasonable thing to assume, but we don't have data that directly say that. So does it make sense to correct a vitamin deficiency? I think it does. Does it make sense for all of us to know if we have a vitamin deficiency or not and to take action appropriately? I think so. Time will tell whether it's truly an active intervention in, in terms of colorectal cancer. We are actually interested here in vitamin D. We're working in coordination with our integrative medicine group um, under a, a, a funded grant. We're going to start looking at vitamin D levels in our metastatic patients and also looking mm -hmm. at can we replete it? Is there something about colorectal cancer that interferes with the bodies being able to absorb and hold on to vitamin D? So we're going to be giving high doses of vitamin D under appropriate medical supervision with monitoring. And then we're going to try to ultimately look at how that might impact on the effectiveness of our therapy for advanced cancer. So vitamin D is an interesting, hot topic. We all want to know the answer before we get there. I mean, when you, you, you pick up the mystery novel and you always you know, want to peek at the end and see who done it. Um, we don't really know the end of the story there. Do I think vitamin D uh, replacement's a reasonable thing to do? Yes. Do I think it's the whole story? Certainly not. And moderate levels seem to be pretty safe. In other words, it's not one of these things where we have to worry too much about overdosing well, I, and what are we talking about. Yeah, I mean, I think what, there are standard recommendations for what are uh, adult daily requirements. They seem to be in flux somewhat from the, the 400 mm. microgram up to 1,000 microgram level. I think in those ranges in people that are otherwise healthy, supplementation is fine. Um, when you start to get beyond that, I think there are issues that would require monitoring. Mm -hmm. Dr. Guillaume, there have been a couple of studies that, that, that have been out relatively recently uh, about missing polyps during colonoscopy. How often is that? Do we have any, you know, a, a really good handle on that? And is that like so many other things in medicine dependent on who's doing it? I think the answer is yes to both. I think that the quality of the uh, preparation, the quality of the individual performing the procedure are major factors in the results. But even in the most uh, experienced and dedicated hands, uh, taking the appropriate amount of time to withdraw the instrument, uh, it's anticipated that perhaps it's may, as high as 20 to 30 percent, maybe 40 percent of very small flat polyps can be missed. And there are some recent technological advances that are looking to uh, enhance the resolution by either spraying or by using different light sources on the, off of the camera to, to make these otherwise insignificant looking small polyps really shine out and the endoscopist being able to see them. But I think it sort of gets back to what I think has been said by my colleagues, the interval of the colonoscopy. If you have a negative colonoscopy, and this gets into a bit of a debate, if you have a negative colonoscopy, can you really, as Karen put it out, can you really comfortably wait for 10 years, which are the current recommendations. Mm -hmm. I tend to be erring a little bit earlier than that um, because I think, and I'll point out to my patients, we're all human and as we're withdrawing this instrument right behind the fold, <clears throat> there could be a small polyp detected. So I think taking into consideration that 20 to 30% or, or thereabout polyps can be missed in optimal settings, I, um, I tend to err on recommending a more frequent surveillance program than every 10 years. Not unlike the, the, the pap test uh, and the pap smears, you, you do that more frequently because the, you may miss something and mm -hmm. the more often you, not the more often you do it, but you do it regularly in order to make sure that you don't miss something that might be there. Right. Max, I've heard the argument made by some people that because it's imperfect, therefore it's not worth doing. And right. I think it's really important to, to dispel that concept. Colonoscopy will always be imperfect. It's, it's, it's done on people, for people, by people. Therefore, it cannot be perfect. It can be very good, and we shouldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. But that it's not perfect doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. If we all do colonoscopies properly, the vast majority of polyps will be detected and removed, and the incidence of colorectal cancer will plummet. We're not going to wipe it off the face of the planet, but we're going to make it a rare disease rather than a major public health hazard. Dr. Goodman, you mentioned the impact on fertility in women receiving radiation. What about in men? What about in young men? Mm -hmm. So, Or uh, in potency, for example, mm -hmm. as well. 
So generally, um, the effect of radiation on um, fertility in men, it's, it's less of an issue. We're really not treating um, down in, in the area where the testes are. And so the dose that's actually been looked at, the dose to the, um, to the testes is relatively low with standard radiation. And in fact, some of my younger patients who are particularly concerned about it, we will actually take a, a reading of the dose to make sure that it is indeed low in order to maintain function. Um, and in some patients where I've had to treat uh, a lower tumor and was more concerned about it, I've used the IMRT technique to really make sure that we were not delivering a high dose of radiation to the testes. Um, in terms of sexual function, and, and there have been look, studies that looked at it, and the testosterone levels after radiation should, may drop initially, but should come back mm -hmm. ultimately. Um, but one of the other issues in terms, and, and, and generally because Anytime you're radiating somebody in the pelvis and they're a young patient, I always ask them to have a uh, to sperm bank. So, and they're also going to be receiving chemotherapy, which can all have an impact on uh, sperm count. So, um, in my young, young patients, we generally, as a rule, will discuss uh, sperm banking, regardless of you know, the fact that there, there's a possibility they'll be able to maintain uh, a normal sperm, sperm count. But in terms of sexual function, it's not as well studied from the radiation standpoint. We do know that um, from a, larger, a large Dutch study when they looked at patients who had preoperative radiation followed by surgery versus surgery alone using pretty modern surgical, surgical techniques, that in men, the impact of the radiation was not so great on the um, sexual function, but the surgery itself did reduce uh, sexual function. And I think that's more a matter of you know, the issue with that Dr. Gia was talking about in terms of the nerves that are in that area and may have an impact on, on sexual function. We know that in prostate cancer, radiation, when it's done um, to the prostate, we can see a decrease in sexual function um, because of the impact on the neurovascular bu bundles that actually run adjacent to the prostate. In rectal cancer, we don't actually target that area as, as much with our radiation, plus the dose is much lower that we give for um, rectal cancer versus prostate cancer. So generally, I usually blame the surgeons for the sexual function issues because <laughs> it's not as much. I, I don't think in, in general it's as much of an issue, but we don't really have as much data as we'd like, and that's something I think we, we do need to look at. Finally, a little controversy. Um, <laughs> since we talked about taboos are, are off the table now, I've got a couple of questions here. Recurring hemorrhoids, possible risk factor, and what about anal sex? as a risk factor for rectal cancer? Do we have any data? Anal sex has not been correlated with rectal cancer. It has been correlated with anal cancer, and there's an important difference. Anal cancer is a cancer right at the junction between the skin of the outside world and the colon coming out. The tissue causes a different biologic type of cancer called squamous cell cancer as opposed to what's called adenocarcinoma, which is a colon cancer. Anal cancer is associated with a particular virus, the human papillomavirus. It's actually the same type of virus and the same serotype of virus that is attacked by the, uh, the vaccines that are now being given to young women to try to prevent cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully, if there's enough uh, successful vaccination of the population, we'll see anal cancer more or less disappear. Anal cancer is a rare disease. It's about 4,500 cases a year in the United States, as opposed to the 150,000 cases of colorectal that we're discussing. Um, and that has been associated not only with, uh, with, with um, uh, anal intercourse, but also with, um, uh, with HIV as well. So uh, mm -hmm. a different situation. Mm -hmm. As far as recurrent hemorrhoids, I suppose that any chronic inflammation might make us nervous in terms of a slight increased risk of, of cancer, but for the most part, no. I think hemorrhoids, the, the danger is more hemorrhoids are benign bleeding, and we need to make sure that that's all it is, right. as opposed to uh, there being a new polyp or a new tumor there that somebody doesn't get pro proper medical attention for because the assumption is it's just hemorrhoids. Mm -hmm. uh, so as, as Karen had alluded to earlier, <clears throat> we feel any blood per rectum needs to be evaluated. It's not because we think most blood per rectum is cancer. We know it's not. Most blood per rectum has a benign cause, but you can't afford to miss these things, and the earlier you find them, the better chance we have of fixing them. There's an old study that actually I refer to periodically, an Australian study. It's got to be at least 30 years old, where 
a nice study was done with rectal bleeding in the physician primary care physician thought it was a hemorrhoid diagnosis. And then all of those individuals with a presumed history of bleeding, thought to be hemorrhoidal in origin, were then submitted to colonoscopies. And in the order of about 18% of these individuals, these are 50 and over uh, men for the most part, wind up having an adenoma or polyp that could have become a cancer and or an early cancer or advanced cancer. And mm -hmm. one of the comments out of that by the Australian community was that you don't want to hang your diagnosis on a hemorrhoid. It's not going to be a hemorrhoid, as everyone has said here, follow up and exclude the possibility that in addition to the hemorrhoid that's there, we all have hemorrhoids. It's like having two ears for the most part. We're all born with three areas of hemorrhoids in the anal complex. There's three little saddles of veins that can, get, can be congested. And when they get congested, uh, something can cause a slight irritation leading to bleeding. So it's, they're rather common, but the problem is that some folks, and we all know them, have thought it was a hemorrhoid that led to um, the bleeding, and in fact, there was something mm -hmm. else also present. Mm -hmm. We know that there is a, a connection, at least in, in certain genetic groups, uh, between ovarian cancer and breast cancer. Is there any connection between colorectal cancer and other types of cancers that one may put you at, at, at a, a greater risk for the other? Well, there's certain syndromes that we've talked about, I think, that, uh, that have been really, really nicely worked out. And these are referred to as the Lynch syndromes after Henry Lynch, who was one of the first to um, draw our attention to these. And these are syndromes where we're seeing, we know the genetic basis for the majority of them. Uh, it's transmitted in an, auto, in an autosomal dominant fashion, meaning that half of the offspring will inherit this uh, uh, mutation and therefore manifest the problem. And what's being found as these populations are studied prospectively and we, on a large number worldwide, we know that they may, for example, the Lynch syndrome patient might have an 80% lifetime risk of developing colorectal cancer, but they'll also have a 60% risk of developing endometrial cancer, uh, ureteral cancers, small bowel cancers, and historically, originally, also uh, gastric cancer. So it, sort of behooves us and we try to refer amongst ourselves to other physicians. If I have someone who meets these criteria, we're making sure to refer them to our gynecologist, to the urologist, and there's a, a, a battery of tests that are uh, required. And I think this gets back to what Leonard Saltz had ser said earlier, is that at least in this population, we know that we have a report card that states they have this genetic alteration and the, and the proper evaluation is a panel of studies. I foresee that in the future, we might be able to do this for perhaps for not only these high-risk individuals, but the lower-risk individuals, so we can tailor screening, not only for the colon, but for the other organs that might also be involved. So if you, you make one kind of cancer, you may be at risk for, for others, and you just need to be extra vigilant across the board. Right. For the individual and also for first-degree relatives, and this is, I think, mm. one of the most important points, uh, something that we drill into our fellows when we're training them is, when you meet a person with colorectal cancer, you have an obligation to figure out who are the other people that are at risk simply because they're genetically related to that person, even if we don't have any known genetic syndrome. So a person who has a first degree blood relative with colorectal cancer. Tell me what a first mother, degree. Mother, father, sister, brother, child, okay? Those people have about a three to five fold increased risk over the general population for developing colorectal cancer lifetime. Now that's still a relatively modest risk because the, the, the risk is relatively low. So three times a, a, a small number is still a relatively small number, but it's higher risk. Mm -hmm. So those are the individuals that we wanna go after most aggressively with our screening. Those people we recommend screening either age 40 for the first scope, or the official recommendations are 10 years younger than the known case when, of presentation I like to say 20 years younger than the known case of presentation because we don't ever want to find a cancer, <coughs> excuse me, in those people. <coughs> we want to find a polyp. If it's there, we want to prevent it. When we have people that have specific identified genetic syndromes, it's important to do genetic testing simply because that may allow us to identify first degree relatives that are not at risk. In the absence of a genetic test, we have to assume all the relatives are at risk. If we know that there's a specific gene mutation that explains the patient's cancer, we then have the option of offering family members, do you want to be tested? And if you are tested and you have that mutation, then you know you are at risk and you'll be screened appropriately. 
And if you don't have that mutation, then you don't carry the risk, your average risk, and you don't need the intensive screening. So the point is, if you are related to a person with colorectal cancer, you must be assumed to be at higher risk until proven otherwise. One thing I was going to add to that, mm -hmm. Max, um, if I may, is that um, I have found that at times the, the reluctance of the first degree relatives to undergo the colonoscopy, and even though I've told them year after year to the point that the next year they come with a loved one, I said, have you had the colonoscopy? And they said, no. I said, well, the next time you show up here, if you haven't had one, we'll prep you right here and we'll do it. That still doesn't do it. So what I've, I've decided is to sort of invoke, now that I'm a parent, I sort of realize that we will do anything for our children. And it dawned on me that I think that if you have an individual, as Leonard pointed out, with colorectal cancer, three to five increase percent, three to five fold increased risk that there might be a risk in that first degree relative. Well, what happens is that once you've got two, or perhaps three, you go from having a few family members to actually meeting a criteria that suggests that it might be the Lynch syndrome, and it might be autosomal dominant, half of the offspring getting this problem. And what pushes some of these younger individuals to have that colonoscopy is that, that I'll tell them, if you, God forbid, got hit by a truck, you get buried. We don't know what is in your colon. You could be burying some very important family history that would have impacted on your next generation, on your next children's having their colonoscopy mm -hmm. at the right time. And I have found that that is actually, rather than my threat of colonoscopy when they come to the clinic, <laughs> it's this concern about their loved one. I said, you're right. I might, my lack of having a colonoscopy and my lack of knowing that I have a polyp at my 45 years of age would translate, if we follow Lonnie's rule, as a 25 is when their children should have had their colonoscopy. So I, I think that's sort of, and I'm, I'm, I, because we do see that from generation to generation, it gets younger and younger. So if you all have had your colonoscopy, good for you. If you have relatives who haven't, just remember there are different buttons that you can push, uh, different types of guilt that you can <laughs> hang on people to make sure that they, in fact, get their colonoscopies. Guilt, guilt works, but a uh, carrot and stick approach uh, is, is important. And one of the things I really do emphasize to the, the family members I'm talking about, what I say to them is, we're not looking for cancer in you. And the overwhelming probability is we're not going to find it. We're looking to protect you. We're looking to make sure you never get this cancer because, unfortunately, you carry a high risk. And we have the ability to control that risk. But this is what we got to do. This is New York, guilt works. <laughs> <laughs> One area that, that uh, also in, in prevention that was hot for a while there and that we've heard some things about and then it sort of seems to have calmed down is aspirin and uh, or calcium. Where do we stand on that? Well, I think the whole idea of this um, the aspirin and, and addressing the, this Cox path, pathway, which is um, where things like um, some of the older um, medications that are now off the market. Um, yeah, that's the, the enzyme that, that things generate, like that. yeah. Um, we, there was a lot of interest, and I, I still think there's, there's quite a bit of interest in the use of aspirin for um, a reduction of risk of uh, development of colorectal cancer. However, um, you know, because of the, uh, the risks of cardiovascular disease associated with things like Vioxx and also this, um, the fact that, you know, many of them have been taken out off the market, there was sort of less interest. Um, but I think the, you know, there's still... I think, and I'm, I could probably defer to, to Dr. Saltz a little bit more about the use of aspirin, but people, um, there's, there's so many good aspects about aspirin in terms of cardiovascular risk, in terms of impact on, um, you know, reducing risk of, of various cancers, in particular colorectal cancer. So uh, I don't think it's completely been out the window, but it's certainly not as much of a, I don't think there's as much interest as, um, as there was previously. Yeah, it, it's a complicated area. You look at some of the aspirin literature and all the things that aspirin can do for cardiovascular health and cancer prevention and so on, and you wonder why in creation the, the aspirin gland was left out of the human body. It just seems like it, it, it's an oversight. Um, and, 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 and perhaps a less flippant uh, counter uh, statement to that may be that aspirin may in some way counterbalance our industrialized society, whether it's industrial pollutants, whether it's uh, the, the lipids in our diet or, or whatever else, it may have some mitigating uh, effect on that. But aspirin is not an all that safe a drug. Ironically, if aspirin were to come to the Food and Drug Administration as a new agent today, I think it would have trouble getting approved and I can't imagine it would be an over-the-counter agent. Um, and what we have to recognize is that for whatever benefits it might have in a certain population, it also carries risks. And for the average risk individual, I don't think we have data to recommend it. 
Uh, in terms of voting with my feet, I'm not, I, I'm not taking aspirin. Um, uh, there are a number of people that, you know, because of specific cardiovascular risk factors, have been recommended to be on aspirin by their internist or cardiologist. That may be a perfectly reasonable recommendation. <clears throat> Excuse me, I don't think we're at the point where we can uh, say that the population ought to be on it right now. So if you're on it for something else, you get that as a, per perhaps as a side benefit, but the, the evidence isn't strong enough to do it just for colon cancer prevention. Right, you know, these prevention issues are not black-white. Um, it's a matter of you need enormous studies with 20, 30, 50,000 patients in the study to see very, very small differences that just make statistical significance and that when you put the curves up, you kind of need a laser pointer to get between them. Um, so it's a subtle kind of thing. If it was a matter of take aspirin, you won't get colon cancer, hey, it's a no-brainer. Uh, it's a matter of if this huge population takes it, we'd be able to detect a blip in terms of reduction. So within that context, the risk benefit gets harder. Similar for calcium. I mean, I think there's a calcium. lot of great reasons to take calcium. I think that uh, we're, we're becoming more aware of the issues of osteoporosis and relative paucity of calcium in our diet. And there are some potential protective effects of calcium. It doesn't mean if you take calcium, hey, don't worry, you don't need colonoscopies and you're protected. Uh, it means that playing the odds, you're shifting the odds a little bit in your favor. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that calcium, I, I, I do think, is a reasonable supplement uh, for a lot of other health reasons and probably has some benefits for colon cancer as well. I generally recommend calcium for our, the women patients in order to um, address the issues that might come up down the line in terms of um, bone density because mm -hmm. the radiation can reduce bone density. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in addition, you know, women over 50 are starting to lose dense bone density or even earlier than that. So I think calcium is certainly a good supplement. Good. We've only got a couple of more minutes here. So let, let me ask you, uh, Dr. Guillaume, this because what if someone has had a colostomy? Um, is that forever? Or are there uh, times or ways that, that that might be reversed? I think if the sphincters were left in place, and we know in numerous situations where someone has required a colostomy, whether it's emergent or whether, uh, as we mentioned earlier, it was not ideal to go and propose not only removing the cancer, but trying to do this delicate anastomosis. Sometimes we do this in stages. So there are situations where someone has had a stoma, whether it's a large colon stoma, which we refer to as colostomy, or a small bowel stoma, which we refer to as an ileostomy, which might intentionally have been done temporarily, uh, or needed because of emergent reasons to be created. So I think there, it's not um, um, absolutely uh, um, a, a contraindication. We do have a program here, which uh, we haven't enrolled many, many patients, but we have uh, the ability to sort of reconstruction of an eosphincter. There are technologies to do that. It's very, very difficult, uh, highly uh, careful patient selection. The highly motivated individual might want to submit themselves to something of that sort. So I think there are some technological advances in the future, but for the time being, if the muscles have been removed, the anal sphincter complex has been removed, that's for the most part a permanent stomach. Mm -hmm. How about a take-home lesson? You each get one shot here at something that you want the folks to take home and remember from our presentation this evening. Dr. Saltz, I'll give you the first try. One? Uh, well, <laughs> okay. yeah, because you might step on All right, that. I think I've, I've, I've uh, beaten the horse enough on colonoscopy, so I'll leave you alone on that one. Um, I, I think what we'd emphasize is that our feeling about colorectal cancer, getting back to the treatment issues for a moment instead of prevention, we are acutely aware that everybody's an individual. Um, both their personality as well as their medical condition and now their molecular makeup is part of our analysis in terms of figuring out a treatment plan for everybody. We are now doing molecular genotyping on every metastatic colorectal cancer patient that we're seeing here at Memorial Sloan Kettering. So we're really moving into eras where we're using molecular characteristics to define therapy. And Every, because everyone's an individual, we have to be careful not to let stories, mythologies, other people's experiences keep us from getting the information we need in order to make the right decisions. Uh, everybody's course is going to be different. Everyone uh, uh, will have different questions, different expectations, and different potentials for a good outcome. Dr. Goodman? 
Well, I think one of the things that's nice about treating colorectal cancer is that we do very well. And I think um, it's, it is gratifying to see that we have so many long-term survivors. And one of the things that I am interested in is the um, quality of life after treatment for rectal cancer. And you know, I think one of the things that we've sort of brought up here are the improvements that have come about over the last you know, 15, 20 years in terms of surgery, radiation, chemotherapy agents. We've improved many things um, in these last you know, several decades. So, and, and I also think one of the things that's, that I enjoy about what I do is how closely I get to work with my colleagues. And we really do discuss everything. We don't jump right in and, and do treatment. We, we take our time. We think about all of the issues. We work together. We, we have a meeting every Monday to discuss cases. We talk on the phone. We email. And I think one of the things about being at a cancer center is that you get that kind of communication between, between physicians. So not only are all of us just, you know, specifically focusing on one area of cancer, we're all also working together to you know, put our heads together and, and come up with the right treatment plan for somebody and to try to address the issues of you know, long-term effects and quality of life. So that's one of the things I really feel is important about colorectal cancer is that you're in a place where you're getting very you know, individualized care but very focused care from people who really think about what they're doing. Dr. Guillen. Well, I would say that as much as I love to operate, I would rather have every one of you listen to your family history carefully, uh, follow all the guidelines, uh, bring it to the attention of your, of your physicians if they're not recommending you the guidelines. Certainly everyone has access to this information. So prevention is the key. Uh, God forbid you do develop a problem that requires uh, a management of a cancer, a colorectal cancer problem, I would strongly urge you to seek the um, expertise um, of a multidisciplinary team that has the understanding of the tailoring of the individual, the timing of the sequence, and the sort of discussion that you've heard here today. And I'm mm -hmm. honored and uh, privileged and, uh, to be able to be associated with such intelligent and thoughtful individuals as Lenny and, and Karen that allow us to discuss these cases and tailor the management for the individual. My take home lesson from the evening is that a lot of people avoid looking into a problem or a symptom because they're afraid of getting bad news. The news won't get any better if you put it off. Take care of it early and the news may be much, much better than if you put it off. So look into these things, get that colonoscopy. I'll add that uh, here at the end. I want to thank our panelists tonight. I hope this has been valuable and, and interesting and entertaining a little bit uh, for you. I think you have a, uh, an evaluation sheet uh, there that you were given when you come in. Uh, please be honest, this is not like your auto mechanic where you say, please give me five all, all the way across the board. Uh, we are, uh, really want to improve this uh, and, do, and see what else we can do to make it more interesting and more valuable to all of you. Again, thank you for being here this evening. Good night. Get home safe.